Amen, amen. God bless you, family. God, welcome to the Morning Devo. I'll probably get in trouble for this message, but we're going to be talking about religious anger. You know, the difference between when I get into my religiosity, when I get into religious mindsets, when I get angry religiously, the difference between that and when Jesus gets angry. People are like, whoa, see, I'm in trouble already. What do you mean Jesus got angry? I thought he was the Prince of Peace. Yes, he is the Prince of Peace. I thought he came to bring peace. Actually, the word says he came to bring a sword to separate and divide. But he came to bring truth, grace, love, hope, mercy, all of it. He brought it all, and he brought freedom with him. And he brought a salvation message. He brought a message of the kingdom, and he got angry. But what was the difference between Jesus getting angry and a religious person getting angry? That's what we're going to try to discuss in a little short time. Can't get too deep into it. It's the morning, right? Good morning, Brother Damien. God bless you. Good morning, bro. Welcome to the Morning Devo. Sister Lissette, good morning. God bless you. Welcome to the Morning Devo as well. And we got Sister Joanne. God bless you. Good morning as well. I'm Pastor Terry Davis. Good morning, brother. God bless you. Amen. Welcome to the Morning Devo. And Brother Sergio, good morning, man. God bless you. So religious anger, such a thing as this or not. And if I'm not careful... I could get into a, a religious mindset and get angry religiously if I'm not careful, if I'm not operating in the love and grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus. The spirit in me doesn't let me go all the way into that type of anger if I'm allowing him to, you know, steer my way, to guide my path. He sold a tremendous seed into my life, the Lord. He sold his life into my life. Can't get any better than that. There's no... Deeper sacrifice, there's no higher sacrifice than God living inside of us because of what he did over 2,000 years ago on the cross um, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So um, it's a lot there, but we're going to just, you know, go through a couple of scriptures and have the Lord speak what he's speaking. I don't have to talk about it. God spoke about it. Amen. Through the Lord Jesus, through his word. So, you know, I don't have to worry about uh, anything actually when it comes to his word because his word is true I'm just reading I'm going to be a repeater of what he said repeat what the word says right I don't, pe I don't repeat too much of what the world says I repeat a lot of what the word says that's that's just my the way I am and I think that's the best place and the best action to take when it comes to religious anger so are you ready or you think we're uh, mature enough to uh, have the discussion religious anger as a morning devo? That's tough, right? I get angry sometimes. What about you? Good morning, Sister Deb. Debbie, Debbie, Deb. God bless. How are you? Good morning. It's good to see you here. So let me pray, right? We're going to talk about anger. Usually when I talk or have a topic about anger, it's more than like the, like the most seen. Like when I do a podcast, I did some podcasts on anger. And it has thousands and thousands of listens and hits and likes and all that. Because everybody deals with anger. Just like everybody deals with sadness, loneliness, temptation, all that. We all deal with these type of things. So it hits home. Especially when the scriptures talk about it. I talk about it because the scriptures talk about it. But I experience anger. Don't know about you, man. But I experience anger um, every so often. So don't front. You know you get angry too. But religious anger is not cool. You know, Jesus got angry, but we're going to see how his anger is different than the religious people of his time. The Pharisees and the Sadducees that were supposed to be the, the leaders of their religion in their time. And the difference, you can see that right away between that type of anger and Jesus' anger. Hey, Sam, your prayers was everything. She goes back to work tomorrow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, for those who don't know, Sergio's wife got hit with that COVID-19 and we prayed, man. We pressed in and we asked God to do what only God could do. So she's be back. she would be back to work tomorrow looking at everybody like, yep, I'm good now. You know, I'm COVID free. Praise God. Thank you for sharing that um, because it's powerful to see uh, the prayers um, come to pass in the lives that we live. Right. So we pray. We ask God and God said, OK, it's pleasing to God to do these things. So thank you, Sergio, and COVID-free. That's what I wanted for the whole family. Nobody got hit, right, in your house 
with the COVID. That was, that was my, part of my prayer as well. And we prayed and we all came together. Amen. You need to control your anger. Yeah. Listen, the secret we're trying to control your anger is not to control it at all. Let it go. Let your anger go and let God keep it. Hold it. He's the only one who can give us self-control. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to control when we're trying to control it. It's like a fire. Think about it like this. It says it's like a fire in a fireplace. It looks beautiful when it's in the proper place, the logs and everything. And, you know, I like the smell of burning wood like that. Um, but if it's in its right place, right position, and it's under protection, so that way it won't cause fire in the house. So a fire in its right position, a fire in its right place is okay. But as soon as that fire, the same fire that looks beautiful, smells good and all that, as soon as that fire gets out of its position, like I, it gets out of control, it will burn the whole house down. So when I think about anger, I'll be like, listen, God, please help me, you know, just take this anger from me because I'm going to, I'm about to blow it, about to lose my mind. Right. And if I take that place, like I take the anger outside of where God wants me to place it, it's going to destroy my own home, my own life and burn things down. I hope that helps you out. But we're going to talk about that. Sister Lissette is a good, that's a good um, you know, request that you need to control your anger. Definitely need to control my anger, especially around my kids. Um, don't want them feeling it's okay to act like that. Yeah, me too, man. I have to watch myself when you know when my daughter gets me a little upset, tight or whatever. I gotta watch myself too. And for a matter for anybody that gets me upset, I gotta watch myself. So I'm right there with you, bro. Anger is a is a is a beast sometimes. If um you know if we're not careful. So let's pray about it before we talk about it. So I'm going to pray and give you a minute to share this out. I have not shared it myself either. Um, so let me um, get, let me cheat a little bit right now and put on my, my page, um, my Cellar Radio Network, and get the groups ready to share. So that way I can start boop, 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 going real fast with it, right? So Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for today. Today is a new day. Um, I believe today is Friday, yeah. So the weekend is here, whatever that means, right? Where I'm at, it's snowing bad again. I got to be out there shoveling again. That could cause me to get angry again. But Father God, thank you for the snow. Thank you for the wind, the storms, all of that. Because we know that because those things are happening, that you're still in control and you're alive and you're well. And you're uh, watching over us. So Father God, I pray that you will help us in our anger when we get angry. Control us, help us. Lord God, give us a, a heart of compassion for other people. Let us have righteous anger, not religious anger, in the name of Jesus. And I pray a hedge of protection over everybody's mind, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, right now, in the name of Jesus. I ask like that your arcing angels, your warring angels, and ministering angels protect us in our homes, outside, while we're driving, um, in our homes, in our workplaces, with our family members, with our enemies, that you would guide, guard, and protect us through it all. Father God, I pray salvation for those who don't know you, Lord God, over all my family members and every single family member represented by people that are watching right now and people who will be watching later on. That the youngest to the oldest people in the family will come to a saving knowledge and understanding of who you are, Lord Jesus. I pray this by faith, knowing that you hear my prayers and you answer them not because I prayed and you answer them according to your word, because your word is your will. I pray this by faith in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Let's go for this minute. Let's share this out. When we come back, the first scripture we're going to hit is, I believe, in Mark chapter 3. I believe. So, let's get it. All right, I'll be right back.
Those minutes go by fast. Let's get into the scripture, man. What's the difference between Jesus' anger and the Pharisees' anger? In other words, the religious people of his time. What, what was the difference? Jesus went into the synagogue, which is the church at the time, the building, you know. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus, his enemies, watched him very closely. You know, you know how that is, right? You ever came late to a, to a church service? People give you that look like, I look at you. They was watching Jesus real closely. If he, feel, if he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath because you have to understand they had these rules and they still have these rules in church, right? You can't do this, you can't do that. But they had this rule about not doing any work on the Sabbath, not doing any work on the Lord's day, on the day to worship, which I kind of, you know, our culture is different. You know what I'm saying? When Sunday comes, I am working. <laughs> I'm working in the church. So uh, it doesn't, with our culture, it doesn't really match up with how they were thinking in their culture because when it comes Sunday, if you go to my church, you see me running around everywhere around the church getting things done. You know, if, um, if it doesn't get done, nobody does it. If nobody puts their hand to the plow on Sundays when we worship. They worship here on Saturday. We worship on Sunday. Then I don't think anything will get done. I, so it was a rule that they made up. So they're watching Jesus. They know uh, if he healed the man's hand, they plan to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Because he knew they were watching him. So Jesus, okay, come on, come to the front. Everybody's watching anyway. Then he turned to his critics and asked, does the Lord permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? He should have dropped the mic right there. That's a good question to religious people. I'm going to read that again. Does the Lord permit good deeds? This is Jesus asking the people. Does the Lord permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? Another great question, right? But they wouldn't answer him. Listen, I would have. I would not answer them either. I would have been like, yo. It's none of my business. I'm out. Because <laughs> those questions are powerful. If you, you answer them, you're going to get in trouble. you would be like, wait a minute. Yes, right. Even It's the Lord's day, but we're supposed to be doing good, right? It's the Lord's day, but we're supposed to be saving lives, not destroying lives. So this man had a deformed hand. So Jesus is like, come here. Come to the front. I'm about to hear that hand. <clears throat> but they wouldn't answer him. I don't, think, I don't think they could answer him, but they wouldn't answer him for sure. He looked around. At them angrily, the Lord looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. So he was angry and he was sad at the same time. Why? Because he knew their hearts were hard, like they didn't want to listen. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand it and it was restored. My God, please, I don't know who this is for. But you're walking around with ailments in your body, but you're not putting them out and giving them to Jesus. Whatever ailment it is, stomach pains, um, arthritis, pain in your arm, headaches continuously. Why don't you give those ailments or those conditions to the Lord? If you never tried it before, I suggest you do. He, he just wants us to hold out those things to him so he could touch them and see what happens, right? So the man held out his hand and it was restored at once, like right away. The Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. I'm like, you, you serious? Jesus gets up, brings the man to the front, asks a couple of questions and tells the man to do something. And the man was healed. That's a miracle. And people hated on him already. Pharisees were the religious leaders of Jesus' time. Um, they believed, I believe, in the resurrection. They believed in the resurrection. And the Sadducees, which were like you know, uh, kind of like cousins of the Pharisees, they didn't believe in the resurrection. Hope I got that right. Yeah, Pharisees believed and Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So, so at once, after this went down, after Jesus healed this man in front of everybody, they went to the supporters of Herod, and Herod was the government. They went to the government, right, and to plot how to kill Jesus. 
like seriously, like not just like put him in jail, not to just, you know, throw him out. They wanted to kill Jesus. Mark chapter three, verses five and six. That's crazy. Every time I hear stories like that, innocent man doing a miracle uh, among his people, right, has evidence. Everybody's watching. They all see what went down. And Jesus is not doing any witchcraft. He's not doing any magic or anything like that. He literally calls a man up, asks some questions to the crowd. They didn't want to answer. So he was like, all right, let me go about my father's business and do a miracle right in front of you. And he does a miracle. You know, gets angry, but sad at the same time because he's angry that these people are like, you know, nobody wants to answer him now. Right. And he's sad because the hearts of the people were hard, man. They were like, we ain't trying to hear that, that type of heart. So he got angry. Listen, it's a difference if I would have did this. If I would have got up, asked the questions, I would demand an answer. Jesus didn't demand an answer. He just kind of knew that they couldn't give him an answer. Or they weren't honest enough to answer the question. What do you do on the Sabbath? What do you do on the day that you worship God? You give life or you take destroy life? What do you do? You do good deeds or you do evil deeds? Which one is it? I would have I would have went into that. I would have stood right there and be like, listen, I ain't doing nothing until you answer me. That's religious anger. The difference between religious anger and Jesus' anger is that Jesus angered and got did not sin in his anger. He was actually saddened. By the people, right? But look what he did. He continued to do what his father called him to do, even though he was angry. When I get angry and I get all into my religion, right? And I kind of like push things to the side. And I dare say, including the Lord sometimes. It's just me. I'm being honest. I'm telling on myself. What about you? So when I get angry, it's and it's I'm starting to feel that religiosity coming over. I have to stop. If I don't stop, I'm going all in angry um, for whatever reason I think is valid to be angry. But if I get angry, there should be another emotion. And especially I shouldn't sin, right? The Bible says you could be angry, you just don't sin. I shouldn't sin and just cause harm or destroy lives. I should be angry in a, in a righteous anger and want to have a life saved or want to see somebody get delivered or want to pray for somebody. Amen. So that way I can operate in the way Jesus operated in his anger. In his anger. Uh, I thought I had more scriptures, but that was the only one I want to hit on. So what's the difference between Jesus' anger and that Pharisee's anger? Those Pharisees that were in the building. Uh, first of all, I see, first of all, that they, they didn't have nothing to say. They were watching him. They were thinking about, you know, you know, what is Jesus going to do? But when they were questioned, they didn't have nothing to say. Religious people really ain't saying nothing, man, for real. You see them on the streets, you know, yelling at people, telling everybody they're going to hell, but they're not really saying nothing. Think about it. Um, I already know, or I already knew back before Jesus that I was sinning. I just didn't define sin as sin. I just knew that I was living outside of the church. You know, everybody knew that. Smoking, drinking, sex before marriage, all that stuff. And we were doing it. So if a religious person was pointing out those things that we already knew, it wasn't really effective. Like, i never seen nobody come to the Lord through being yelled at. And, that, and they're angry. Well, you know, I always, always wonder, if they have God in them, this is what I used to always wonder. If they have God in them, why do they look so angry? Look like they want to fight. Like, oh, you're going to go to hell, but come to my church Sunday. I was like, what? I ain't going to your church Sunday after you practically... You know, curse us out practically in a nice way, but I'm not going to your church. You're yelling at me. That's religious anger. It doesn't really move the heart of anybody. You know, if you want a set of rules and regulations upon you, uh, on top of the laws that we have to follow in this in this world, in the government system, if you want more rules and regulations, and you know what you can't do, and this is what you can't wear, you know how you got to dress and all that. Then go to a religious church, man. It's on you. If you need religion, go get it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stay free from religiosity, religious anger, and religion. It doesn't, it doesn't love you. Religion can't love you. Religion can't save you. It just gives you a whole bunch of rules and regulations. That's why a lot of people get confused. Where they, when I'm speaking about the Lord, they say I'm religious, but they're not listening. Am I speaking? Did I speak about any religion? 
Name one religion I spoke about all this time that I've been speaking. Think about it clearly. People say, oh, you talk about God. That's religion. No, God is a person. I'm speaking about the Lord Jesus, a person. Speaking about what happened with people, not what happened with a religion. The religious people in the scriptures are, talking, are thinking about, all right, we, we, we're having a Sabbath. We're in the church. So let's see. He's not supposed to do any, any work. So they were thinking about rules. And Jesus was thinking about doing his father's business. That's the difference between the anger that the Lord Jesus had and the anger of the Pharisees. Now, another question would be, how do you separate your anger? How do you differentiate your anger um, that you feel? Whether you're in church or not, a believer or not, you get angry. I, I know if you're a human being with a heartbeat, you get angry. You get mad. You want to rip somebody's head off sometimes. You want to curse somebody out sometimes. Yesterday, driving, I was driving. It was ice on the floor. Um, so here comes the 4x4 the four four trucks and the Jeeps acting like there's nothing on the floor climbing up on you, man. Like everybody's going 30 miles an hour. They want to go 60. And then they look at you and they flip you the bird, middle finger, and act like, you know, get out of my way. Why are you driving so slow? And I'm like, what? You know, it don't make no sense. You know, I'm, a, I'm here getting stuck trying to go up a little incline. And here comes a, a Jeep looking at me like, why are you holding me up? And I'm sliding backwards. And people are like, you know, angry. That type of angry, anger will get you in trouble. That type of anger will get you hurt. Accident. I almost got into two car accidents and I got stuck twice in, in the ice. I had to back up, make all kind of U-turns and go different ways to try to get to where I was going. And on top of that, you know, I was given extra... Um, meds that weren't on my list so you know instead of me getting angry and sending it back and you know trying to see who was the slick person that did this to me i let it go did what i had to do and came home as safely as i could and god god kept me safe but i was angry yeah i was angry but i didn't have to sin i have to get any kind of religion jump out of a car and say you know you're not you must be a sinner because you're driving too fast on the ice you know what i'm saying like i'm not i'm not built that way but yet people say I'm religious. In Jesus' time, they wanted to kill him. And he was not religious. He was the Lord and the Savior, the living word of God, performing signs, miracles, and wonders, up in the church, being watched, telling a man, hey, stick out your hand. I'm going to you know, fix it. Miracles being done, and people want to kill the miracle worker. They want to kill the messenger. Uh, they want to kill the righteous man. But they want to hang out. With the religious people. Don't make no sense, man. Doesn't make any sense at all. But I understand if, you know, people want religion. They want, you know, set of rules so that way they could feel like they're, you know, they're good. We all fall short, but it shouldn't be an excuse. Yeah. It's not, you know, it shouldn't be an excuse. You're right. Um, but when we fall as a believer filled with Holy Spirit God, um, he gets us back. He helps us back up. We don't stay down for too long. So do you differentiate the different types of anger that you feel? Do you say, okay, um, this is not, I'm angry, but, you know, it's not all of that. Um, but, you know, now sometimes you get angry and it is all of that. And you be like, okay, enough is enough. I got to do something about this. Um, so it's tough. How do you do that? Like, how do you, like Sister Lissette said earlier, you know, I have to learn how to control my anger. I need help to control my anger. We all need help controlling our anger. But how do you do it? I'm thinking, listen, I have Holy Spirit God living inside of me. And I still get angry. And still sometimes I lose it and, and lose my temper. So, And I have Holy Spirit God living in me. Imagine a person who don't believe, who don't have Holy Spirit God, who just wants to, you know, you know do their own thing. How do, they, how do they readjust their anger? You know, I know people that lose it all the time. And they ain't no joke. Like, you, you cross them, it's going to be pretty much a wrap for you. And, you know, angry people stay angry. There's no, you know, there's no cutoff switch. You know what I mean? A lot of Incredible Hulks out there, you know, they're always turning green. And they're always getting big. But, you know, how do you control that? There has to be a way to control it. Eddie's going to hit us with scripture. He said, this is how I'm going to do it. Proverbs 29.11 tells us that fools... Vent their anger, 
but the wise quietly hold it back. This scripture does not mean that the wise bury their anger or do not deal with it, but it means that they control their anger and how they express it. There it is, right there. Proverbs 29, 11. Thank you, Brother Eddie. Listen, that's deep. Fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. And it's not easy. Try to hold back your anger when somebody's threatening your child or your family or your wife or your husband. Or, you know, they're just cursing you out for no apparent reason. Try to hold your anger back on your own with your own willpower. It's not easy, man. But when Jesus got angry, people say, if Jesus got angry? Yeah, he got angry. Remember, he flipped over the tables uh, outside of a church one time because they were outside, right, of the synagogue selling potions, lotions, you know, selling doves, um, you know, a way to get blessed. They would say, if you buy this, man, you're going to be blessed. Holy water, probably. And Jesus was like, what's going on? This is supposed to be at my house. is a house of prayer. And you're turning it into a den of thieves. And he started flipping tables over. But if you read the scripture closely, he didn't hit nobody. Right? He was dealing with the situation. He wasn't really, you know, angry at the people per se. He was dealing with, you know, how people were operating, how they were thinking, man. Turning the church into a storefront. You know, so... We have to be careful as the body of Christ. I go to a church. How about you? You go to church. If not, if you see churches that uh, like operate like a business storefront or maybe, you know, selling things by the time you, before you get your seat, you already uh, had two, three salesmen in your face trying to sell you uh, holy water, anointing oil, a book or something or stuff like that. Before you get your seat, then that might be an indication of how they're operating or what they're thinking about. It might be the greatest people in the world, good intention, but um, it should be a house of prayer. Now, I went to a prosperity church, and I, I didn't go alone. I think it was me, um, my brother Reese Johnson in the faith. I forgot who else was with us. And we had to check it out for ourselves. When our owner, I think Brother Anthony was with us. Um, uh, I believe so. We had to check this prosperity church out for ourselves because we were like hearing so much negativity about it. And all, all, they do, all they do is preach about prosperity. It was in New York. And at the time, it was in Madison Square Garden or around that area. And they were renting out one of the rooms. And you know what was amazing? I was already judging them. I said, oh, as soon as we get there, they're going to start selling us um, books or, you know, trying to make us members of the church or they're going to try to give us envelopes right away to sow a seed into some kind of miracle or some kind of thing, right? A shocker, we got, I got there, but we got there, there the whole, uh, Matt, like a whole long hallway. You know what people were doing? We're greeting you and praying for you. Greeting you and praying for you. When you got into the sanctuary, you know, where the people were worshiping, they have like no music, no nothing. People were praying in the spirit, in the tongues, powerful prayers. Like, you felt the anointing of God in there. And that's not televised, because this thing was televised, still televised. Um, I don't think they're in, in New York no more, I don't think. But um, start looking at each other, we're like, oh, they should. this is what they should be filming. Because when a preacher preaches, it seems like all he's preaching about is prosperity, but we don't know how the atmosphere was being set, because it's not on the camera. And, you know, I had to I had to be quiet. I had to suck it up. But like, okay. Then when the church service did start, that praise and worship was amazing. I don't think they televised that either. They just televised the part where right after praise and worship, after the announcements, then they televised, uh, you know, the preacher because he's famous. And his message, you know, at, the, at that day, I had to admit, was about, you know, church fund, like the building fund. They wanted to buy... <clears throat> They wanted to buy where they were renting. That's deep. And they were putting numbers on the screen and all that stuff. But we got to be careful. So it wasn't a prosperity, all prosperity. They actually had, you know, the spirit of God operating. And what they were reaping from that was riches. And it's just a rich church. They got no bills, you know. But if you see a church operating the opposite, you walk in and they're, you know, trying to sell you stuff or whatever. You might get angry because you might be like, listen, if I want all of this type of, you know, salesman thing, I'll go to a, a store where they ask you, do you need help? You ever been to a store? You just walked in literally and you just walked in and two seconds later, you know, they're just doing their job. But 
can I help you? And I'll be, I always say, um, no, I'm just looking. Like literally, I just walked in like two two steps into inside the door, and people, oh, do, do you need help? You know, and that's their job. So I don't get angry. It's just that it's just, you know, cool out. You know, I just walked in. Um, but you know, I don't know why I went there. So what is the difference between Jesus's anger and a religious person's anger? That was really the question I had. Amen. Uh, thank you, um, Eddie, for sharing that scripture. My husband says uh, all the time, lose my anger. Well, you know, think about it. Is he telling the truth or is he lying? And if he's telling the truth about it, take it to the Lord, my sister. You know, always is a strong word. When I get, um, you know, upset, maybe me and my wife have strong words against each other. I'll, always, I'll, I'll, I'll use the always word, but it's not true. My wife is not always like this, that, and the third. She's not always getting me angry. She's not always. But we say it out of our anger. So you always do this. You always do that. But you, everybody knows it's not all the time. And um, husbands and wives do argue. So um, nobody should be shocked that a Christian marriage has arguments in it. Christians are humans. You know, forgiven humans. It's amazing when you walk into a church and feel welcome and blessed. Yeah. When you feel welcome and blessed, you know, you put your guard down. You're like, okay, this is not all about money. They just don't want my money. They're not selling me stuff. Or you feel welcome. That's why we have a team that welcomes people into the church. Welcome. You matter. You belong here. Uh, I'm glad you're safe. And anything I can do for you, it should be an act of service, not an act of getting. Right? And, you know, and if somebody comes in angry... Uh, we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit, God, Holy Spirit, God, will take that anger from them and they will leave. We've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, one time, my pastor was preaching. Uh, pastor Raina, she was up on, you know, on the pulpit preaching. And this man comes with a big machete knife. So all the men were ready for this man. We were about to take him down. Um, my, pastor, uh, my pastor's husband, you know, Pastor Charles, he, the leader. Walked up and, and looked at the guy and made sure, look, man, we, we got we got our eyes on you. You make one wrong move. <laughs> and, you know, um, you're going to see what the men of the God are all, all about. But the power of God came over this man. And Pastor Raina stood her position. She looked right at him, stood her position in the anoint, an anointing she was under. And said, listen, I don't know what's going on, but that's coming, that, that night was coming down. Nobody's going to have to rush, bum rush him or anything. And this man got angry, started crying patiently, and put the knife down on the altar. Right? And everybody was like, oh, what's going on here? And that anger turned to tears. The Spirit of God turned that man's anger. He was about to do something crazy that day. That's why he had that big machete. And he just laid it at the altar, laid it, gave it to God. Just stood there and started crying. So instead of the men going to bum rush this, this man... We ended up praying, hugging him, surrounding him, and loving over him uh, because it wasn't going to go down like that according to the word, according to the Lord. Amen. The best part is when you feel the Holy Spirit as you walk into church. Yes. Yes. Listen, if you go to church and Jesus is not there, get out. If you go to church and the Holy Spirit of God is not there, get out. If you go to church and people are acting crazy, get out. Go to another church. Go to a, a church that they they love Jesus. They love God. They really believe in God. It's not all about what they could get from you or what you could do for them. It's about how we, the body, could serve the people that's coming in. And this might be a little shocker. Not everybody who goes to church is a Christian. Not everybody who goes to church is a believer. There's been, and it's messed up, but there have been um, cases of people being atheists, being the preacher of the church, and they're atheists, and they're just trying to fool everybody. They don't even believe in God. It's been documented. I've seen videos on it and people testified and real people saying, admitting it, that they were atheists. That means they didn't even believe in God and they would be in universities teaching Bible classes and in um, churches preaching from the pulpit. So we just got to be careful. So that's what I have. What is the difference between Jesus anger? Read Mark chapter three. Read the whole thing so you know I'm not taking it out of context. Read Mark chapter three. And see the exchange, man, why people were so angry at uh, Jesus. Maybe there was that religious anger is kind of corny, man. Like it has to go. Well, you can't do that. You can't do that in church. You can't do that on the day that you worship God. You can't work. You can't do this. You can't wear earrings. You can't wear makeup. You can't wear pants if you're a woman. You can't. Uh, 
Come on, man. Um, let people live. Now, when I started going to church, when I first got saved, I used to dress baggy everything. So, um, the, you know, the elders of the church were probably looking at me like, oh, man, Lord, change this man. He's coming in here like he's going out, you know, to hang out with his friends. And this is the house of God. So I must have, you know, threw some people off because I didn't know any better. You know, I had to learn. I, I didn't know, you know, I thought it was about, you know, just going into a building, looking the way you want to look. And, you know, and I remember the first week that I got saved, um, there was a situation um, that I was threatened, just put it like that. And I'm just a week saved. So that threat didn't work too good with me. And somebody had called me. And say, listen, you know, if you go home tonight, it's going to be a wrap. I'm going to your crib and we're going to let you have it. You know, you trust God or whatever. You better trust God. And it was, it was ridiculous. It was just silly. But I was only a week saved. So I went, told my older brother, I said, look, we got to go. He said, what's going on? I said, we got to stake out our own house. They're coming for us. And my brother's like, oh, okay, let's go. And that was the end of that. We, you know, he had, he had the front, I had the back. And we were staking out. We were ready for what was to come. That was our mentality. But then God stepped in. Do you, can you believe that this person who knew exactly where I lived called another one person that I, I know? And he called me. It's like, what's going on over there? Like, why does this dude want to go and do something to you and, you know, in your crib? I said, I don't know. He goes, but guess what? He don't even know where you live. He's asking me, where does he live? Where does he live? And I was confused. I was like, what are you talking about? This dude knows where I live. He's He, he came to my house like a million times. What do you mean he doesn't know where I live? He's yeah, he's calling me right now. He doesn't know where you live. And then um, I got convicted. I was like, all right, Lord, you got this under control. You're protecting me. So why did I leave the church and act like, you know, I'm not protected? And, you know, we over here staking our own crib. Never came. Nothing never went down. I even seen this, this dude like months later and he didn't even know what I was talking about. I didn't bring it up. He didn't bring it up. And we left it right there. Coincidence? Or was that God? I got angry because I was a week, just a week in the church, a week saved. And somebody was threatening me. I said, nah, we're we, we about to, you know, handle this. If you know what I'm saying. And um, it never happened. I can tell you, I can tell you a thousand stories at least of God's protection over my life. Yasmati, God bless you. Welcome to the Morning Devo. She has a word, Proverbs 4.25. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Amen. Stay focused. That's right. Thank you, Sister Yasmati. Stay focused. And that's all, you know, we could do. And what are we focusing on? Our anger? Religion? Nah, don't focus on religious anger. Focus on the Lord Jesus, how he handles his anger. Because he's that's a righteous anger right there. Angry and was saddened. There was another scripture that said he got angry, flipped over the table. Uh, all he got angry at religious people and was telling them off. A lot of times you can read it in the in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can read it for yourself if you don't believe me. But he did not sin, and he didn't hit nobody. He didn't hurt nobody. Uh, he was letting them know he was directing his anger towards the situation, not the person. You know. Um, and that's the way, you know, I have to learn how to ang handle my anger, too. So it's a process. Amen. So I hope you got something out of this, something, a nugget or something that the Lord spoke to you. Uh, thank you for the scripture um, that people put up. And um, we're here and we're dealing with our anger issues. We're dealing with it. But let's not become religious people that are religiously angry. Let's not look mad all the time, um, you know, still trying to understand why I sometimes look mad when I'm preaching the gospel or speaking about the Lord. Why am I angry? I, I, I will actually, I thought about it the other day. You know what I think it is? Why, why we Christians look angry sometimes and we're talking about the love of God and we look angry. I think it's our flesh that's telling us, no, don't say that. Don't, don't mention the love of God to nobody. And I think it's the flesh literally angry. Like the flesh, like our own bodies telling us, no, don't say that. And it's angry. Say, no, don't preach the gospel. I think that's what it could be. I could be bugging, trip, tripping right now. But um, I know when I'm, when I'm into it, I look angry. It could be that the flesh that's warring against the spirit is literally showing up in my face like angry. Like, oh man, this guy is preaching 
you know, and getting people, you know, the truth of the Lord Jesus. And we don't want that. I don't want that. The flesh could be my imagination. Uh, but if we're preaching about love and we look angry, it could be the flesh that's trying to hold back that love. Right. So it's just a thought. You know, I'm not putting any doctrine on it. I'm not saying to believe what I'm saying. I'm just saying I was thinking about it the other day and that's what came up in my mind. So. All right. So you're very welcome. Sister Lissette, thank you for coming by for this morning Devo. I want to pray and uh, continuously for you and your family and everybody. Can please continuously pray for me and my family. We are all in this together. Um, you know, we don't know what the day brings, but we do know who brings the day, right? Um, so God bless you all, man. Have a great weekend. I don't know. I'm going to go out there and shovel snow. It's not the you know, most fun thing to do, but I have to do it. And just pray for me that I won't hurt myself, you know. So God bless you all. God keep you all. And remember always that God is good. Peace.